Okay, in this lesson we're doing the triangle mid-segment theorem. So I've had you guys go ahead and log into Big Ideas Math and go to the dynamic ebook. We're going to use that activity in a minute, um, but I just wanted it ready. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what a triangle mid-segment is. And a triangle mid-segment is a segment that connects the midpoints of two sides of the triangle. So one of the things that we're going to need to find those midpoints is the midpoint formula where you average the x values for the endpoints and average the y value values for the endpoints and that will help us find the midpoint of each side and then if we connect those then we get mid segments. Every triangle that you have is going to have three mid segments as part of it. We're not necessarily going to use all of the mid segments, but they're all part of the triangle. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the endpoints for this triangle. We're going to say A is at 0, 4. C is going to be at 8, 4. And B is going to be at 2, 8. And then we're going to find the midpoint of each of those sides just by averaging the x values and averaging the y values. So to find the midpoint of AB, we're going to average the x values. So 0 plus 2 divided by 2. And we're going to average the y values, 4 plus 8, divided by 2. So we get 2 divided by 2 is 1, 12 divided by 2 is 6. So the midpoint for AB would be 1, 6. So we would say this point right here is 1, 6. I'm going to call that N. And then if we want to find the midpoint of BC, same thing, we're going to average our x values. We have a 2 and an 8. And when we average the y's, we've got 8 and 4. So our midpoint, 10 divided by 2 is 5. 12 divided by 2 is 6. We've got our point N right here at 5, 6. So MN is one of the mid-segments for this triangle. If we want to find the others, we would need the midpoint of AC. If you notice that AC is a horizontal line, you know the midpoint is just right in the middle. So if it's something that you can easily identify by looking at it, that's fine. We could just put our midpoint right there in the middle. I'm going to call it P. And we've got a mid-segment here, there's, that's it. the second one. Mm -hmm. It does happen to make another triangle inside there. And then what we're going to talk about is kind of how each of those mid-segments relates to the other side of the triangle. Since you know that P is the midpoint of AC, what do you know about AP and PC? They're congruent. So there are a lot of things that we know just kind of looking at this triangle. One of them is that since we're dealing with midpoints, we know we have two congruent parts kind of on either side of that midpoint. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to that exploration in the textbook. Each of you has a little sheet of paper that looks like this. And in the dynamic ebook, on page 370, you should have it should look just like this. Next to each exploration, there's a little green square that says Desmos. And so we're going to use the first one. Just click on it and it'll open a Desmos exploration. And if you click on any of the points, you can kind of change the way the triangle looks. So what I want you to do, once you've seen that, I want you to take point A and put it at negative 3, 
2. Point A is going to be at negative 3, 2. Point C is going to be at 6, 2. And then let's put B at negative 1, 7. This triangle, we're all going to do the very same triangle, but the next ones you're going to do on your own. On your sheet, it says the first thing they want you to do is find the length of mid segment DE and then the length of AC. So I made these horizontal lines so that they were nice and easy and we didn't have to do much in the way of calculation. If you want to find the length of a horizontal line, you can just subtract the x values. So for DE, E is at positive 2.5 and D is at negative 2. So what's 2.5 minus negative 2? Oh, 4.5. Oh, yeah. 4.5 minus a negative. And then for AC, we can just do 6 minus negative 3, which would be 9. So you're going to go ahead and put that on your form. DE was 4.5 and AC was 9. And the next thing it asks for is the slope of each of those. So what do you notice about those two lines, DE and AC, those segments? They're horizontal. They are parallel. Um, and since they're horizontal, they both have a slope of zero. So we don't have to do any calculation on that. We know that horizontal lines have a slope of zero. Okay. okay, now that we've figured out how to get it to add the labels, now we know what those lengths are, and we're not going to have to do any work to find them. What I want you to do now for your next two triangles is move some of the points to create a new triangle. And it's going to go ahead and calculate the length for you. I did my other length again, so I'm going to ask you to find that length again. Oh, 3.81, I moved it over here. It might be nice if you can make it to where it rounds to something nice, but don't, don't worry about it. It should work no matter. But then once you do that, you're going to have to find the slope on your own. How do you find slope? You could, use the, minus you could use the slope formula, but if you have a graph, it's probably easier to do rise over run. So once you have your triangle somewhere that you like it, and you like the numbers that it's giving you, go ahead and plug that information in to your table. Fill in the lengths and then calculate the slopes. Be sure you're careful as to whether or not they're positive or negative. Is this triangle two? This is triangle two. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing your slopes, you may get something like rise of one, run of 3.5. If you get a decimal in your slope fraction, then you just need to do whatever math it takes to get that decimal out. Like for example, I know that if I multiply 3.5 times 2, that would make it a whole number. So if I multiply both of these by 2, I could get 2 sevenths. Another way you learn to get decimals out of fractions is to multiply both of them by a power of 10. So if we multiplied them both by 10, we would get 10 over 35, which would still simplify to 2 sevenths. So if one of your fractions gave you a decimal, that's fine. Multiply by whatever you need to to make it not a decimal anymore. So I went ahead and put in my information for my three triangles. Um, our first triangles are all the same, but our second and third triangles are different. Um, what did you notice about the slopes of your mid segment and that third and that other side? They're same. So if we know that the slopes are the same, what does that tell us about the lines? What kind of lines have the same parallel. slope. Parallel. parallel. So the mid segment is going to be parallel to that third side. What did you notice about the relationship for the lengths? Oh. Which oh. one's half? Oh, D. D. E. 
should have been half of AC. It's like one of mine is like point one off. That's so what they're tweeting. If there was some rounding in there, then that's probably so. Okay. But but pretty close, right, to them being the same. That's one of the things that we learn about mid segments is that the mid segment is going to be parallel to the third side, and it's half as long as that third side. That's one of the theorems. Okay, so the rule is down at the bottom here. If the mid segment is x, then what's the length of the other one? No, I mean, two x, right? And the slopes would be the same, which tells us that the lines are going to be parallel. That, what we just did, is showing us what the mid-segment theorem says, which we're going to write that later in our notes. But we started out with just defining what the mid-segment is, which is finding those midpoints and connecting them. If you go back to the textbook page, you go back to this page right here, there's, an explore, there's a second exploration that you can click on. And when you click on that one, you get all of the mid-segments for the triangle drawn at the same time. And you can see all kinds of information. You can move it around and make it a little bit easier to see. And you could, let's say we extend, I put it right here. It's a little bit easier to see when I look at it like this, that DE has a length of four, and AF is four, and FC is also for it's going to show us all of those and then you can see that FD has a length of two and so does EC and BE and your homework is going to ask you to use those relationships sometimes it's going to ask you to show that those relationships are working and so that's what we're going to do with this next, next example I'm going to give you a minute to go ahead and write this down draw the graph label it as it's labeled and write down the information that's given. Okay, so in this example, they tell us that MN is the mid-segment for JKL. So we know that M is the midpoint of JK, and we see that N is the midpoint of KL. And they ask to, sh ask to show that the lines are parallel. So what do we know about parallel lines? They have the same slope. So if we're going to show that they're parallel, we need to show what their slopes are. When you're doing this in your homework, you want to write down what you're doing. So I'm going to say slope of MN and slope of JL. And you have your two options. You can use the slope formula or you can use rise over run. If you only have the ordered pairs and you don't have a graph, then I would use the slope formula. Since we have the graph, I would just use rise over run. So when we look at MN, does it have a positive slope or a negative slope? Negative, negative slope. So we know it's going to be negative. I'll go ahead and put that in first. What is the rise? The rise is 1 and the run is 4. So MN has a slope of negative, mm -hmm. and then for JL, is it also negative? No. Yes. And it has a rise of 2 and a run of 8. I'm going to go ahead and write negative 2 over 8 and then simplify it so I can see exactly what I did. Are those lines parallel? Yes, how do we know? They have the same slope. So that's what I would say. I would say MN is parallel to JL because they both have a slope of negative one fourth. Or you could say because they have the same slope. Either way. So MN is parallel to, and you can use the parallel symbol if you want. MN is parallel to JL. They both have a slope of 
of negative one fourth. It's more writing. There's not a whole lot of work to show in there, but you see that they're the same slope. And then the next thing they ask us to find is that MN is half the length of JL. Now, when we were using Desmos, it did those calculations for us. I want you to be able to do those calculations on your own. So this is where the distance formula is going to come into play. So we're going to want to write the distance formula again. And I would write down what we're finding. So I'm going to find the length of MN first. So once I write length of mn, I'm going to write out our formula, which is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. It is kind of an ugly looking formula. I wouldn't try to do many shortcuts because we tend to make mistakes. Um, we do have to subtract first then square, then add, and the square root has to happen very last. We can't just take the square roots of these two squares and say, oh, they cancel each other out. We've seen before that that doesn't work, so we're not going to do that. We're going to go ahead and put our numbers in. Mm -hmm. Underneath mn, it might be a good idea for us to write the ordered pairs for m and n so that we can use those in the formula. Can you see what the ordered pairs are just by looking at the graph? Yeah. Then do that. If you can't, then use the midpoint formula to find them. But I think we can see m is negative 4, positive 3, mm -hmm. and n, n is 0, positive 2. And then we're just going to plug that information into the formula. We're going to subtract our x's and subtract our y's. And 0 minus negative 4 and 2 minus 3. I do the subtraction and the squaring in one step. If you want to show it in two, that's fine. 0 minus negative 4 positive 4 squared is 16 and 2 minus 3 is negative 1 and negative 1 squared is positive 1. Most of the numbers that you are having to square you ought to be able to do in your head. But when we get to the point of having the square root of 17 that's not something we can do in our head. 17 is really close to what perfect square? 16. 16. So we know that our answer is going to be a little bit more than 4. Um, if you plugged it into your calculator, you would see it's about 4.1. So we're just going to go ahead and write about 4.1. So that gives us the length of mn. And we want to show that that's half of jl. So now we need to find the length of jl. This is kind of a tedious process, but there's only like one problem on the homework where you act to actually have to practice showing all of this stuff. You do want to know how to do it, but I'm not going to ask you to do it over and over. So let's find the length of JL. Point J was at negative 6, 1. You know that I like you to write the formula over and over on this one since we've already written the formula. If you don't want to write it over here for JL, that's okay. We can just go ahead and plug our numbers in. If you find that you make mistakes when you plug them in, I would write down the formula. So we're going to do x minus x, 2 minus negative 6 squared plus negative 1 minus 1. We'll go ahead and 
do our computations. So 2 minus negative 6. What's 2 minus negative 6? 8. And 8 squared is 24. Plus negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. And negative 2 squared is 4. We're going to get the square root of 68. What perfect square is 68 closest to? 64. And the square root of that would be 8. Is it going to be really close to yeah. being double that? Yes. And if you plug it in your calculator, you get that it's about 8.2. So is 4.1 half of 8.2? Yes. So we showed that MN is half of JL because 4.1 is half of 8.2. And I'm not going to make you write all those words out. We can do that if we want. Um, all right. The triangle mid-segment theorem, this is the one we've been talking about, but this just puts it into words. So I'm going to give you a second to write this down. The segment containing the midpoints of two sides of a triangle is parallel to the third side and half as long. Okay, so once you have that written out, we can also write the algebraic way of saying this. And we would say MN is parallel to BC by writing the parallel symbol in between. That's one thing we know. And we know that MN, the length of MN, so I drop the bar above it, is half the length of BC. put a big or next to this thing. So I said MN is parallel to BC and that MN is half the length of BC. It might be easier instead of saying that MN is half of BC to say that BC is twice as long as MN, so it might be easier on some problems to say twice the length of MN is equal to the length of BC, because some of the problems, your lengths are going to be algebraic expressions, like MN might be 6x plus 15. So I want you to be able to choose which of those that you like better. One of them is fine. What kind of questions do you have? Yes. So that's, that's the end of the notes. On your homework, what you'll notice is there, there are going to be a, different types of problems. Like on three, it's going to say find the coordinates of D, E, and F. Those are the midpoints. So you can use the midpoint formula, or since you have a graph, you can just use the graph. But then on five, it says show that E, F is parallel to A, C. You have to find their slopes. Then it says show that A, C is where the EF is half of AC. That's when you're going to need to use that formula. Look at problems 17 through 19. So on 17 through 19, it says that A, B, and C are the midpoints of the sides. And then they're going to tell you like AB is 3X plus 8 and GH, or sorry, GJ is 2X plus 24. You're going to be setting up your own formulas for, or setting up equations for those. Just be careful to determine sometimes the segments that they're talking about are going to be equal. Sometimes one of them is half of another one. Sometimes one of them is twice the length of the other one. So you can set those up however you need to solve. Um, and then they're asking for the length, so not just asking for x. Yes. 
You may want your calculator for the square roots, but you'll only need that on number five.